and, and I think the league's going that way, too, on both sides of the line of scrimmage. I mean, you start looking at guys on offense that can play in the slot, play at running back, BH backs. There's really not a label for them. They're just either dynamic players or they're not. And then you start looking about trying to match up with those guys on defense. And, you know, when you start looking in any division, particularly ours, in the tight ends, for instance, that we have to play in our division, and you kind of go, who matches up? You want to play man coverage, who can match up with those guys, those type of guys? They're big guys that run fast. Who do we have? So I think more and more defenses around the league are saying, who are the guys that you don't necessarily have to put a label on that are dynamic football players? And, you know, Isaiah Simmons has played on the back end. He's played at linebacker. He's come off the edge. And really, I think the only limitations on him are whatever the defensive coordinator puts on him. I'm sorry? I'm surprised that it took two questions to get to Dirk, but thank you. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the bottom line is this. I think everybody needs to understand at what level Derek Carr played last year, okay? The guy completed 70% of his passes. He had almost a 3-to-1 touchdown interception ratio. I think we're number 11 in the league in total yards. We were seventh and third down conversions. We did a lot of really good things on offense last year. The disconnect was we didn't score a lot of points. You're 11 in yards and 24 in points. There's an issue. It's defense, it's special teams, it's not scoring in the red zone, and it's not scoring in goal to goal. Okay, so to me, those are the issues. Derek Carr played at a high level. I'm very happy with Derek Carr. What I've told everybody I've been in touch with since the day I took this job is we're going to evaluate every position every year. And if we can get better, we will. And I guys get tired of me saying that, but that's really what I told Mark Davis before I took the job. And that, that's my mantra. I don't make anything of any rumors. All, all I can tell you about free agency, because I'm not allowed to talk about any of them anyway, is that I've watched tape of just about every guy out there at every position. And all that does is uphold what I'm telling you, is that every position gets evaluated every year. And if we can upgrade it, we will. Good. I, I think the, the biggest difference for me personally, and it's not a sexy answer, is, is basically uh, for 18 years I was the Lone Ranger at the NFL Network. I had to be responsible for my own content, show up here at the Combine, do my podium, and make sure I knew something about 337 players. But then I'd go home and do my individual thing again and get ready for the next hurdles. Uh, as a GM, you're managing people, and I don't think people really understand sometimes what a job that is and I enjoy it it kind of invigorates me so uh, one of the first things I had to do after the draft last year was get a, a different group of scouts in there so we made some changes in the personnel department which I couldn't be happier about so I'm managing people uh, coach Gruden and I collaborate on pretty much everything so what it really comes down to is going from the Long Ranger, who just had to watch tape and talk about players, to, to being in charge of trying to br bring uh, and develop uh, uh, so something that's really just an individual collection of talent into a football team. Antonio Brown, I, I have... Very little comment about. I, I think he had his time at the Raiders, and I think his time there is up. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I, I, Josh obviously had a great year. We couldn't have been happier with Josh. Uh, Josh can catch a football, and I think challenge number one for him in year two is developing those talents. Now, you got to understand, to catch the football in John Gruden's offense as a running back, not only do you have to run routes, you got to protect your quarterback. He's got the physical capabilities and the toughness to pass protect. We just have to make sure in stage two this year, this development of him as a receiver, that he can do all of it. If he's got to stay in and knock down a defensive end, he's got to do it. If the linebacker's coming, if he's got to scan, so those are hard things for a rookie running back, and we didn't want to put too much on his plate. But he certainly has the physical capabilities to do it, and we're going to expect more from him this year in that department.
the quarterback position. I mean, I think arguably the quarterback position in the NFL is the hardest position to play in any pro sport. I believe that. So we spend a lot of time every year on the college quarterbacks, on the crop of free agent quarterbacks, uh, and we'll always do that, especially with a, a head coach that's quarterback centric. I'm sorry. Interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the traits are, are leadership, they're, they're accuracy, there's pocket awareness. There's a hundred different traits I could roll down for you. Uh, I think you need to be a leader of men. I think you've got to have a mentality that when you get in the huddle, there's a 10 people expecting to follow you. And you have to be that alpha male. And I think alpha males show up different ways. You don't have to be a screamer and a yeller, but you have to earn the respect of your teammates. After that, what you're talking about is a guy that can handle John Gruden's offense, can spit it out, has the intellectual capacity, the, the, the gigawatts to handle all that and translate it on Sunday. And uh, on top of that, of course, is accu accuracy. I think pocket awareness is an underrated uh, commodity. I think it's difficult to, to really evaluate too many college quarterbacks on pocket awareness because they, they're playing a different style of football than we are. So um, there, I could give you a thousand things over 10 hours and bore you to death, but, but that's kind of the, the top end view of it. Well, I, I, I would argue that there are just as many misses up top at, at wide receiver as there are at quarterback. And if you do the numbers and look at the first-round picks. Um, but I think the biggest deal at the quarterback position is just the transition from, from the way they play in college to the way we play in the NFL. Uh, the verbiage, the huddles, the leadership. And then once the ball snapped, when that picture changes, when you think you see something and the picture changes, your ability with, with a group of grown men trying to knock you down to stay in a pocket, handle it, and go through progressions and find the right guy to get it to. I've, I've asked this question when I was on the media side. I asked all the top quarterbacks over the last 18 years. I sat down with the Mannings, the Bradys, everybody over the last 20 years. Is pocket awareness innate? Or is it something you can learn? And almost every one of them said, you know, I always had it since I was a little kid. You can learn some ball security, drop your shoulder, try and dip through the... There's some things you can learn, but for the most part, you either have it or you don't. An ability to sidestep and find a lane to throw the football. So it's a really difficult quality to, cut, to, to understand. We, we've got a quarterback that runs John's offense at a very high level. It's a cross check. All the new technology, we'd be foolish to say we're not into analytics or GPS or whatever. I used to laugh when I was at NFL Network and they put a thing up on a, like a guy ran 53 yards, and, but he really ran 92.7 at 20.1 miles an hour. And I was like, what does that mean? He's weaving all over, and, and it's interesting, uh, I thought, but now that I've gotten into it, I, I can go back and confirm in the fourth quarter of a game for a wide receiver or a corner that's already played 62 snaps whether or not he's running as fast in the fourth quarter as he was in the first. And I'd be a dumbass if, if I didn't or wasn't aware of that information. Yeah. I... I think there are several reasons. I think reason number one is uh, the lack of quality press coverage in college football. Uh, when you've got a grown man trying to keep you from getting off the line of scrimmage that's competent, long, and tough, that's a, diff that's a different issue, okay? That's number one. Number two is when you are able to get off the line of scrimmage and the picture changes, the coverage changes, you could go from being the third option on the backside to the first option on the front side. And you gotta, you got to filter that on the run without slowing down. So think about it. When you have to slow down and you're thinking, what happens? Physically, you're slower. You're not there. You, why do guys not look as quick as they did in college? That's usually the biggest telltale is because they're confused. They're not sure where they're going. And then I think number three, it's just – how much offense you have to absorb. I've met with some of the, the college wideouts already this year, and you know what they're doing. Half of them are doing this pre-snap. They look over at the sideline, and they have their own individual coach telling them what route to run. That, John Gruden's head would explode.
Right? You better get in there and get in the huddle, and, and you better learn three positions, not one. And what he's asking you to learn is mind-boggling. So I think they're the three main reasons a r- rookie wide receiver production isn't where it should be in the NFL. I, I think on the surface, and we're starting to dig into that class right now, right? I mean, so I've seen all these numbers about how many fir- – how many guys are going to go in the first three or four rounds? Here's what I would tell you. Uh, the average over the last five years for wide receivers to go in the first three rounds of the draft is about 12. It's between 12 and 13 a year. Okay, You can easily make an argument from a grade perspective that there are 20 to 25 of those guys out there this year. Now, that's just from a grade perspective. I'm not saying they're, go- they're 20 to 25 are going. So there's depth throughout, and there's quality up top. So I think from a why, that's what you're looking for in any class. And, and on paper today in February, that's what we see. Yeah, I, I just think from my perspective, just constantly be aware of the big picture. You know, I think coaches and GMs have two different snapshots. And then coaches look at, you know, what gets us better on Sunday. And I think GMs look at it like, how are we going to be better long term? And I just think uh, I have to do a better job of managing our roster during the season at certain positions. I didn't like uh, I, I, we weren't particularly good at linebacker this year. Uh, I think I made some mistakes there. We weren't particularly good at wide out last year. I think I made some mistakes there. So I just need to do a better job. Bottom line. What's that? The draft class? I, I think the thing John and I liked the best about our draft class was Um, from top to bottom, including free agents, they were who we thought they would be, both as players and people. They were that kind of foundation that people got tired of me talking about last year before the draft. They were foundation kids. They love football. They love ball for what it is, not what it brings them. And to me, that's a big distinction. Boy, you're asking the wrong guy that one. I mean, I have no idea what the NFL does or doesn't do to prick data during during game days. Uh, I'm trying not to puke up in the box for three and a half hours. I mean, that's really the truth. So I wish I could answer you better than that. I think the NFL would be crazy to move it from Indy. I mean, I've been here for close to 20 years now, and uh, people forget that it's not about Thursday through Sunday night when the players work out. It's about the medical, the psychological. you got to move 337 kids throughout a city with hospitals and doctors. And if you go anywhere else, I don't care where, you're not going to have anywhere near the portability and the convenience of this city. So outside of the fact that it's in, in February and it's cold here, um, the NFL might want to move it around and do what they did with the draft. I certainly, but that I don't really care about that. I care about the efficiency of the football operation, and I think they'd be crazy to move it. The changes in the schedule, I can't do anything about them, whether I like them or not. Yeah. Yeah, I friggin' love Max Crosby, okay? And what we loved about him on tape is what you saw this year, which is just a relentless pursuit during every snap. So we, we put the tape on in Eastern Michigan, and, and to be really honest, he didn't have much of an idea of what he was doing. He didn't know how he was doing it. But I saw this long kid that bent, could bend like Gumby and understand when you're his size, the ability to bend is rare, okay? He could bend, he had length, he had effort. He had motor. What was crazy about Max last year is he came in and I forget. Remember, I, I mean, I, I lectured him on getting with Deuce Gruden and working out. I mean, from a nutrition perspective and a weightlifting perspective, it's rare to see a kid in college gain 15 pounds his rookie year of good weight. He came in at plus or minus 250, and he was playing 265 late in the season. That's a huge difference with absolutely – no problem with the movement skills. So he got bigger, he got stronger, he kept the same movement skills. And what I love about Max is I get texts from him almost every day. 
telling me what he's doing, why he's getting better, how he's getting better. And I think the challenge for our entire rookie class who had some success last year is to take that jump from year one. You hear people talking about rookies. The, be the biggest advancement you should have is year one to two, right? And now we've got a bunch of guys had a little taste, a little bit of success. They're going to get game planned. Josh Jacobs, Max Crosby, they're all going to get game planned next year. Can they take that next step? And the only way they can do it is work their asses off. That's the bottom line. Well, I think every team self-evaluates, okay? And if you look at our offense, again, we were number 11 in yards, and we, we, we've got some – we're a pretty good offensive team, and I think everybody standing here knows we need help at wideout. We need to be better. You know, the, the Antonio Brown thing left a void that we weren't really able to, to fill. Um, so we need to get better there. Um, defensively, we're not very good at all. So I kind of go into the defensive side of it with a mindset of who helps make us better at any position. Uh, we have so many needs over there. It's just who's a dynamic football player that makes us better. Well, I, I think they did a great job, and I give, I give John and Kyle and those guys a ton of credit. And I, I would disagree. I don't think it happened overnight. I, you know, their quarterback got hurt, which artificially set the record back for a year. Um, but what they've been building over several years is a group of talented defensive linemen, uh, a culture, and, and everybody laughs about that word. I don't. Okay, Building a culture is way harder than, than people pretend it is. It's easy to say and hard to do. And that's why I give them so much credit is they've built a culture on toughness. They run the friggin' ball. They believe in getting after the quarterback. You know, I, I love what they've done, and I give them a ton of credit, but it didn't happen overnight. I, I mean, I think uh, I get a little nervous when you start talking about, you know, Makai Becton in a boat going to the Bellagio. You know, you know, that kind of stuff makes me a little nervous. And if you remember any of my work at the NFL Network, I don't really like a lot of the sideshow stuff. So uh, from where I sit now, I think it's going to be exciting as hell in Vegas. I think people are going to love the, the, the backdrop to the whole thing. I think the excitement for the city is awesome. But for, for me and my department, it's business as usual. And we're probably going to be in Alameda. Uh, we're probably not going to be set up in Vegas yet. And we're going to be in our draft room in Alameda. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Raider Nation, what's going on? Is this the number one Raiders channel on YouTube? For Chucky Heads, believe it, baby. And if you haven't already, subscribe right here. I'm giving you Chucky Heads news, rumors, Raider Nation rumors. And look at this. I'm making your life easier. Check out my next video. Thanks for watching, and go Raiders.